Good afternoon or good morning for those of you joining us from the West Coast. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining the Network for Public Health Law for this webinar on reproductive health and data in a post row world today. So you'll, you should find a question and answer function on your screen. Feel free to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation. We will be moderating them and answering as many questions as time permits at the end of the substantive presentations. My name is Madison Bikabner. I am a JD candidate and senior, senior legal researcher with the network's Western Region Office, and I'll be moderating today's session. And we have some great panelists today. So Erica White is a senior attorney with the network's Western Region Office. Stephen Murphy is a public health senior attorney with the network's Mid-States Region Office. And Carrie Wagner is a deputy director for the network's Mid-States Region Office. From these speakers, you'll learn about the impact of the Dobbs decision on reproductive health care access across the nation and the implications for reproductive health data, privacy, and sharing. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Erica for her presentation. Thanks so much, Maddie, for that, or Madison, for that gracious introduction. I'm so excited to join y'all this afternoon to talk about Dobbs and the um, privacy implications of this decision. So today we're going to be talking about the Dobbs decision, and then before I turn it over to Stephen and Carrie to discuss privacy, we're going to talk about the emerging, emerging, emerging reproductive health landscape. But before we can discuss Dobbs, we need to start with these two important constitutional law Supreme Court cases. Roe v. Wade, of course, is the 1973 reproductive rights case that started it all. This is probably the most controversial Supreme Court case out there. Holding that a Texas law restricting abortion was unconstitutional, the court held that the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment provides a fundamental right to privacy that protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose abortion. But this right is not absolute. It has to be balanced against government interests in protecting women's health and protecting prenatal life. And the court resolved these competing interests via a trimester system. States were prevented from fully banning pre-viability abortions, usually in the first and second trimester. The effect here was that many state laws overly restricting abortion access were struck down immediately after this decision. Planned Parenthood v. Casey from the 90s reaffirmed Roe v. Wade a Pennsylvania law that required spousal awareness of pre-abortion procedure was struck down because it created an undue burden on that fundamental right to abortion access. It's true that Casey reaffirmed Roe, but the court did away with the trimester system in favor of this undue burden standard where abortion restrictions enacted for the quote purpose or effect of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion of a non-viable fetus. Those laws are now unconstitutional. Now let's talk about Dobbs, the reason we're here today. So in 2018, Mississippi enacts this very restrictive abortion law that um, bans the procedure after 15 weeks, except in very narrow circumstances. Now I have our friend Justice Amy Coney Barrett on here because something changed when she was nominated in 2020. The legal landscape or the, the makeup of the court is what changed. So other states were, um, they felt very bold in enacting laws that were similar to Mississippi's or some that were way more restrictive like Texas where they completely bore, banned abortions at all. And the uh, Mississippi's law of course was challenged. And in 2021, a district court stuck it down. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in Louisiana struck it down because of course this is unconstitutional under our precedent of Roe and Casey. But in 2022, the court heard the case and they issued its um, opinion in June of this year, only six months ago, I can't believe that. Uh, where they fully overturned Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. So there's two legal lands, those two cases that we talked about a few slides ago, those are completely gone now. We have a new legal framework for evaluating abortion restrictions. So this is Justice Alito, he wrote the majority opinion. And here's how he got there. He looks at the 14th Amendment. Um, Alito writes that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment has been held to guarantee that some rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution, like rights to privacy and abortion access, um, those are valid, but those rights have to be deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And he says that that language does not include abortion access. Abortion is no longer a protected fundamental right, and the right to, to regulate that procedure is now returned to the states. It's no longer protected under fun the federal constitution. But what about precedent? Does that mean anything anymore? How does he get around 
decades of settled constitutional law. Well, here are five factors pulled from Alito's opinion. First, Alito says that, well, we would like precedent because we can rely on it in future court decisions, but that doesn't really apply in the case of abortion because most abortions are unplanned. So there's no reliance interest, right? Easy for him to say. Second, he says that Roe um, wrongly removed abortion from the democratic process. He says that abortion is highly controversial, which is true. He says that um, it's a very important policy matter. And this should be given to the, um, uh, the, to the people to vote on um, and to their elected representatives to decide. So in his mind, he's doing a really good thing. He's returning that democratic process to the people. He says that the court and Roe, and again, and Casey were making policy and judges can't make policy. That's related to number three. He says that um, the courts in Roe, um, he said, well, first of all, Roe was egregiously wrong, which is a very famous quote he's going to be known for, right? <laughs> but he says that that decision was more legislative than judicial. This is policy. Courts are for, um, forbidden in the Constitution from having the power to make policy. That's a job for the legislative process and for the people. For Alito really does not like Casey's standard, that undue burden standard. He says that, what does that even mean? What does that look like in applying that in practicality? It's a really squishy standard. He doesn't really like applying that. He says it's created a lot of confusion. So he's gonna provide us with a more workable rule. He's gonna let states do that. And then finally, he says that uh, abortion and reproductive rights cases have had impacts on other constitutional law cases. Um, he says that they've dilated the standard for facial constitutional challenges. They've ignored the court's third party standing um, doctrine. They've disregarded uh, standard res judicata principles. Um, he says they flouted ordinary rules on severability and all these other things. And then finally, he says they've diluted and distorted First Amendment doctrines, which is very interesting. We'll come back to that later. So what's our new standard that we're looking at? Well, Alito says um, that abortion um, has to, um, that states may regulate abortion if there is a legitimate government interest. And he gives us these six examples. He says that a legitimate government interest, um, one example is respect and preservation of prenatal life, protection of maternal health and safety, elimination of particularly gruesome or barbaric medical procedures, preservation of the integrity of the medical profession, mitigation of fetal pain, and prevention of discrimination. So in Roe, we had a really high standard of abortion restrictions, strict, strict scrutiny. That's the highest standard. So when judges are reviewing state laws that restrict abortion, most of the time those laws are going to be struck down because it's a fundamental right. But now under Dobbs, we have a rational basis review standard, which is the weakest standard. So most of the time the state restrictions and laws are going to be upheld under this new standard. So the legal landscape has completely changed as of six months ago. So here it is, this is our new standard, just all laid out, no bubbles. Um, we're, we're looking at legitimate government interests. But before I move on, let's take a look at the other opinions because they are some really good ones here. Now, Justice Thomas wrote a um, now infamous opinion where he concurred and he says that actually the court should go further in the future. I mean, future cases, they should reconsider other um, cases that granted rights based on substantive due process. And those would include Griswold v. Connecticut, which um, found the right to contraception active access, Obergefell v. Hodges, which found rights to same-sex marriage, and Lawrence v. Texas, which banned laws against private sexual acts. Thomas wants to go back and revisit all of these. Our friend Justice Kavanaugh, he says, well, the Constitution is neutral about abortion, so maybe the court should be too. And very interestingly, he defends the right to travel. He says that, okay, we're getting rid of a federal um, constitutional right to abortion access, but no woman should be penalized for crossing state lines to um, get the procedure. Interesting that he felt the need to bring that up at his concurrence. Chief Justice John Roberts also wrote a concurrence and he's very well known for judicial constraint. He says that the court shouldn't have to strike down precedent. What he would wanna do is reverse the Fifth Circuit, Fifth Circuit decision. He would want to um, find the Mississippi law legal, but he doesn't want to completely overrule precedent in Rowan Casey. He wants to respect the uh, past opinions of the court, but still uphold that Mississippi law. And finally, we have a scathing dissent written by Sotomayor, Breyer, and Kagan. It's really worth the read, even though it's quite long, filled with good quotes. What they say is that the rights that Roe and Casey recognize do not stand alone. All of these rights are interconnected and they've been used to, uh, over the decades to find countless other rights. 
Um, and if you remove one of them, the whole thing is going to come crumbling down like we pull the st string on a sweater. So we can see from this concurrence and the dissent um, that privacy rights are implicated. Um, they are up for debate now. Are they really no longer as strong as they used to be? And no matter what Alito says, he swears up and down in his majority opinion that the constitutional right, that this um, case is only about abortion and it's not about any of the privacy rights. He promises you. But that's really hard to take his word there when we have Justice Thomas, who is dying to revisit these other cases. He really wants to. And our other concurring justices, um, Coney Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch, they also would really like to revisit some of these rights. And as our dissenters pointed out, they're all highly connected. Okay, so now let's turn to what abortion access is like post stops. So here's a map from, this is um, accurate as of today, but we have states where um, abortion is expanded. So these are states that have enacted additional state laws protecting abortion. We have states where it's protected, where um, access is currently protected legally. Our states in orange here, like New Mexico and Virginia, abortion is not protected, meaning that it's accessible, but it's not explicitly protected via law or constitutional amendment. Hostile states, of course, like our Western region, home state of Arizona. Um, Arizona has attempted to enforce bans, um, but that ban is temporarily not being enforced right now. So it's they're hostile to abortion, even though the procedure may be available. And then of course, illegal, that speaks for itself. That's where states like my home state of Texas, where the procedure is not available and it may have um, criminal or civil penalties associated with it. So this data is from a New York Times piece in late October, and it found that in the first two months after Dobbs, um, legal abortions nationwide fell by 10,000, which is 6%. That is a massive decline. 13 states that had banned or severely restricted abortion, mostly in the South, those ab abortion levels in those states fell to almost zero. The nine states that had major abortion restrictions, um, abortions fell by about a third there. And in states where abortion remained legal, the number of abortions increased by about 11% or 12,000. So that suggests that around half the women who were unable to get abortion in their own state were able to travel to another state to get one. Now let's look at abortion medication. So this data is from a nonprofit that provides um, abortion medication via telemedicine. And they found um, that in after the Dobbs decision, and you can, they broke it down by um, where bans were likely versus um, total bans and other kinds of bans, how the request for medication abortion increased. And look at this, they increased, they tripled, quadrupled, doubled in these states. People are really interested in getting medication abortion. This is a massive jump. And whether or not they're using it right then and there or saving it for a rainy day, we don't know, but this is still very significant. And another interesting note is that overseas pill use climbed. So more and more people are requesting abortion pills from overseas, whether it's Canada or, or pharmacies in India or elsewhere. All right, so now that we've talked about the Dobbs decision, let's move on to the emergency, emerging reproductive health legal landscape. So first, this is a network resource and all the resources that I'm going to show you um, the next few minutes are available on our network website. Um, and they have a link down here when the slides are available later today or later this week. And we also update these routine regularly. So this first resource, we looked at some state-based abortion protections. We focus here on state constitutional efforts and there's three kinds that we're looking at here. First, we have nine different states where their Supreme Courts have found language in their constitution that protect abortion rights. Second, we have um, states where efforts are being undertaken to expand um, the state constitution to protect abortion rights. And then we have the converse. We have states where they're trying to limit, eliminate language in the constitution that would protect abortion. So let's take an example from um, some state constitutions that they have language um, that could protect abortion access. So here's New Jersey. They say that all persons are uh, by nature free and independent. And they have certain natural and unalienable rights. And we have Alaska and their constitution says the right of the people to privacy is recognized and shall not be infringed. And as a reminder, state constitutions, um, they can be broader than the federal constitution and the rights that they infer and protect. So here's our language. And now here are a few examples of state Supreme Court decisions that interpreted that language. So in New Jersey in 1982, their state Supreme Court found that 
um, the right to have an abortion as a fundamental right based on that constitutional language. And they reaffirmed that in 2000. And then in Alaska, in, in the 90s, they looked at that language in their state and their state constitution and found that reproductive rights are fundamental um, and re, um, within the right to privacy. And they reaffirmed that in 2019. This is really interesting. All right, here's another network moment we have. We're looking at abortion um, litigation themes post stops. So when we talk about litigation, we're looking at challenges to three kinds of laws. We have trigger laws that were on the books and they set to go into effect in states after Roe was no longer the law of the land. We had pre-Roe laws. So these are laws that restricted abortion that were on the books. And when uh, after Roe, they were overruled by that precedent, but they're still on the books and still out there. And state attorneys general would like to enforce those again. And we also have laws that would violate Roe or Casey. So these are laws that were enacted more recently um, that would be unconstitutional. But now that Dobbs has gotten rid of Roe and Casey, um, states want to start enforcing those laws for the first time. So let's take a look at a few uh, litigation themes from these examples from our memo. So one theme that we've identified is preemption. So preemption is this idea that federal law is the supreme law of the land and any conflicting contradictory state law is overridden or preempted. So one example of this would be EMTALA. So EMTALA is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active uh, Labor Act. And following the Dobbs opinion, um, the Department of Health and Human Services issued guidance that said even in states where abortion was illegal, um, abortions are still allowed if a physician determines that the pregnant woman's life is at risk. Because what EMTALA says, it says if there's a patient that presents at an emergency room having a medical emergency, that hospital is required to stabilize them. And HHS has said when there's a pregnant woman involved and where stabilizing her may include an abortion, you have to do it. And of course, that didn't fly in some of these states. They challenged it. In Idaho, um, they, um, there was a lawsuit where the court found that actually, yes, EMTALA is the supreme law of the land, and you have to provide an abortion if there um, is an emergency. In Texas, we had the opposite reaction, the opposite outcome, where the Texas court said, actually, EMTALA doesn't apply here. This is the state's um, ability to say what the doctors can and can't do. So uh, doctors in, in Texas do not have to um, provide an abortion if they're, even if there's an emergency. But both of these cases are up on appeal. So we still don't have a final answer of what exactly is going to happen with Intala. Another litigation theme we identified is vagueness. So there's this constitutional notion that if laws are vague, if they're arbitrary, capricious, or vague, um, those are unconstitutional because we really don't know what standards they're enforced under or they, and they don't get fair notice of what actions are prohibited. So one example would be in Louisiana where it was um, where people sued and they said, we don't know what exactly is prohibited or how this law is going to apply. And the judge initially agreed, but after um, this was appealed, the law is back in effect. And in Arizona, very interesting example of where the governor and the state attorney general were, weren't even sure which law was in effect. They were both talking about different laws and different penalties. Um, and so when Linda gets sued to say this was too vague, the judge agreed and this um, the Arizona law is not in effect in the moment. So let's turn back to state constitutional challenges. Um, Florida is a really interesting case because um, the Supreme Court has previously recognized that privacy rights in their state constitution include abortion rights. Um, but um, that, that's still being challenged and um, lower judges have agreed um, and this is up on appeal right now to find if and where they're asking the Supreme Court to reconsider um, the state's privacy rights and does that really include abortion rights? So this is kind of up in the air and the Supreme Court has declined to fast track it but the Florida Supreme Court will likely hear this case very soon. And then another example would be in Ohio where um, although initially this law was allowed to go into effect, um, courts have found that Ohio's um, constitution does include privacy rights that do include rights to abortion. Um, so that had that converse result there. All right, and then one more example is Michigan, which is very interesting. Um, Michigan has a 1931 ban on abortion, which would have gone back into effect following Dobbs when it's no longer blocked by Roe. Um, however, that law was initially blocked. And Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan had asked the Supreme Court to um, um, to ahead of time declare that the Michigan state constitution includes abortion rights. And then again, um, another effort was that there is a ballot initiative to add abortion protections to the state constitution. And that was up on the ballot a few weeks ago during the midterm elections, and guess what? It passed. So Michigan added an amendment to their state constitution protecting abortion rights. 
and Michigan wasn't the only state. Michigan added language to their constitution, creating a right to reproductive freedom. California also approved an amendment that affirmed fundamental rights to choose to have an abortion. Um, Vermont added an amendment that um, protected rights to personal reproductive autonomy. So this is really great. These three ballot in initiatives passed overwhelmingly to add language in state constitutions protecting abortion. And conversely, we have Kentucky, where they overwhelmingly rejected in a, a ballot initiative that would have added a line to the Constitution saying that nothing in the Constitution shall be construed to secure or protect a right to abortion. So this overwhelmingly failed. So the voters have spoken. All right, one more network resource I'll um, point you to is this one, um, abortion access routes. So we've talked about all these different ways that abortion access has been restricted, but what open doors remain? So here's the link that you can check out later. So we've identified 16 open doors, and I wish I had time to go through all 16 of these with us today, um, but you can check these out in more detail, but I'll show you a couple of examples. First, Medicaid waivers may be an open door. So this is very interesting. So Section 1115 of the Social Security Act gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services the authority to approve um, states requesting to do innovative things with their Medicaid, um, Medicaid programs. And so following Dobbs, President Biden and the Secretary of HHS encourage states that want to expand abortion access to apply for a Section 1115 waiver um, to receive federal funding to pay for travel costs associated with receiving, receiving abortions. That'd be great, right? This sounds like a really great idea. Um, and it is, but unfortunately, no state has yet applied to do so, despite being encouraged by the federal government. Another problem is that the Hyde Amendment bans uh, federal funds from being used on the abortion procedure itself. So patients would still have to pay for that out of pocket, but the Medicaid funds would still cover travel costs. Another pathway is telehealth. Now, telehealth is great. It's really expanded dramatically during the COVID-19 pandemic, where it used to be only available under Medicare and Medicaid, for example, for um, just a very short list of types of services and types of providers. But it's really been expanded during the pandemic, and um, Biden and HHS have promised to try to uh, preserve that expansion post-COVID emergency. But the idea here is, is that telehealth is a way to, for patients to access mifepristone and mifeprostol, which are um, called the, the abortion pill, which I'll call it today too, um, for ease of access, um, but patients can use telehealth um, to get a prescription to the abortion pill and to receive follow-up care. And even in states where abortion is illegal or severely restricted, patients may still be able to obtain a prescription um, where they can have it mailed across state lines or if abortion is still legal in their state, they can get it mailed to um, a pharmacy near their homes. This is like a really great easy way to access. However, um, there had pre been previous FDA restrictions on dispensing mifepristone um, to only through uh, physician supervision, but FDA has relaxed a lot of these guidelines and they could modify these even more to make this even more accessible. All right, so before I turn it over to Stephen and Carrie to discuss um, data privacy, let's talk about one more thing that is related, and that is First Amendment concerns. So this is a piece from the New York Times published by a great health law professor, Mary Ziegler, this is over the weekend, um, where she says that the next anti-abortion tactic, tactic is attacking the spread of information. So how is the First Amendment implicated with abortion? Well, this all goes back to the abortion pill, right? Because anti-abortion or um, anti-abortion advocates have a big problem. They really thought that when states were able to severely restrict abortion procedures, that meant that the, the overall number of abortions would dramatically go down. And that ha is true to an extent, but like we saw a few slides ago, patients are still able to cross state lines. Um, it's very easy to access the abortion pill. Um, so they're really not seeing the sharp decline they wanted to see. So that's a problem for them. So they want to really attack people from even finding out about other options um, or even talking about abortion options at all. And they're doing that by trying to restrict speech and trying to create a confusion so people cannot find out about other options. And the abortion pill is really at the crux of this because it's easily uh, obtainable, it's relatively affordable, um, it's very, very safe, and it walks and talks like a miscarriage. So if a patient is um, has taken an abortion pill and presents at an emergency room or other doctor, there's no way to know that she's taken the abortion pill. She's just miscarrying. That's what it looks like. That makes it really hard to enforce first trimester restrictions on abortion. This has been all over the news for a while. 
So when we talk about misinformation around abortion, um, there have been a lot of pushes to um, obfuscate the safety of abortion, um, the availability, what an abortion even means, if it's available, um, and uh, lots of pushes via social media too. So according to a few report, reports, disinformation about abortion care more than doubled on Facebook and Twitter the week following the leaked opinion draft back in May. And immediately following Dobbs in June, um, anti-choice groups started spending thousands of dollars on ads that um, were intended to misform audiences about abortion. Another point is that a misinformation um, um, impacts certain communities differently. So here there have been several articles about um, Hispanic communities that have been targeted um, and they've been specifically targeted because there may be um, language barriers or uh, the, uh, barriers to care that they already have that are exacerbated even more here. Um, so there's campaigns intended to manipulate these communities as well. So a lot of advocates are telling us that freedom of speech and First Amendment concerns is the next big abortion fight. Um, because of course, First Amendment and freedom of speech is not absolute. States are able to um, restrict free speech in certain situations and commercial speech even more so. Um, but when you're trying to limit people's availability to access information about abortion methods or other open doors to abortion, um, that's the crux right there. Um, and a lot of those challenges are going to continue playing out in the next few months. And that's really an area to watch. All right, so now I'm happy to turn it over to my great colleague, Stephen Murphy, to bring us into some more data privacy issues. Thanks very much, Erica, for a fantastic overview of developments following the Dobbs decision. And I am going to speak today about some pressing concerns around the privacy of reproductive health records following the Dobbs decision. And um, I'll note that the day that the Dobbs decision was issued, uh, steps were already uh, in motion to protect the privacy of reproductive health records and uh, those concerns had already um, been voiced. And so what I'm going to talk about today is some developments on the uh, federal, state and local levels, uh, because there has been action on all levels of government uh, around this. So can you go to the next slide, please, Erica? Thank you. And so uh, let's just kind of start with some level setting, because this is a story that has been in the news uh, as recently as this last weekend. This is the case in Indiana that involved a 10 year old uh, that was from Ohio and had been the victim of rape and was uh, uh, in Indiana for a, an abortion. And so there has been some fallout from this. And so as we think about concerns around law enforcement trying to get access to uh, reproductive health records, this is a great case example where the Attorney General in Indiana has pursued uh, the medical records of the 10-year-old. And just this last weekend, a judge uh, issued uh, a ruling uh, refusing to um, block the release of the records to the Attorney General. Next slide, please. And um, so this concern around law enforcement gaining access to reproductive health records is real. And here's another example here from Texas earlier this year. This was before the Dobbs decision. Um, this was a case uh, that involved a 26 year old woman in uh, rural South Texas who was hospitalized for complications following a self-managed uh, abortion. And in that case, the, a nurse in the hospital uh, notified law enforcement uh, of what had happened. And that woman was charged uh, with murder and was held on a uh, $500,000 bond. Ultimately, the district attorney dismissed that case because of a Texas law that exempts a pregnant person from being charged with murder or any lesser homicide charge for an abortion. Uh, however, you can see how this also makes the concern around law enforcement gaining access to uh, medical records of individuals seeking or having an abortion is real. Next slide, please. So uh, let's start with the developments on the federal level. Um, and this takes us back to uh, just a few days after the Dobbs decision and um, the secretary for HHS. Secretary Becerra uh, 
instructed OCR, which is the agency that enforces HIPAA, it's the Office for Civil Rights, uh, instructed them to issue uh, some guidance around the privacy of uh, health records, amongst other things. And so that resulted in two guidance documents uh, from OCR. Next slide, please, Erica. And so the first one uh, relates to HIPAA, and uh, it mostly talks about law enforcement. And so the ability of law enforcement to gain access to records and whether HIPAA prevents that or protects those records. And what OCR said here was that the privacy rule permissions for disclosing PHI without an individual's authorization for purposes not related to healthcare, such as disclosures to law enforcement officials, are narrowly tailored to protect the individual's privacy and support their access to health services. So that's a very positive affirmative statement from OCR suggesting that HIPAA uh, does protect uh, health records from law enforcement and that those exceptions for things like disclosures to law enforcement or uh, for oversight, that those are narrowly tailored. I think that might be an overly optimistic take on uh, how HIPAA protects these records, um, but let's have a look at some of the provisions within HIPAA that OCR pointed to. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, I think we're on the right slide here, Erica, thank you. So there's a few provisions that they pointed to, including uh, permitted disclosures that are required by law. And so this is a provision within HIPAA that says, if there is a law that requires the disclosure, then HIPAA says it's okay. And there, OCR said that that is uh, a provision that allows for disclosure of protected health information where there is a mandate that's contained in law that compels the disclosure and that should be enforceable by law, which is accurate. Uh, and then the next one was disclosures to law enforcement. And here OCR pointed to uh, a couple of provisions that uh, permit disclosure pursuant to process. And OCR's take on it was that uh, that particular provision permits but does not require disclosure of protected health information. Now, that is pretty much true of almost all of the permitted uses and disclosures of protected health information that are contained within HIPAA. Really, only the disclosures to, uh, to OCR, to the Secretary for HHS, <coughs> excuse me, in the course of a compliance review or investigation, or to the individual and themselves, those are required. Everything else generally is permissive. Um, and so uh, OCR also said that, you know, that all conditions have to be met in order to uh, release protective health information pursuant to process. So, you know, if you have a court order or a grand jury subpoena or a subpoena that's issued by a judicial officer, that the uh, disclosures have to be limited to what's contained in those um, documents. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is also true. Now, there's other provisions within HIPAA, within that same section of HIPAA that allows for disclosures to law enforcement that were not addressed by OCR that are of concern. HIPAA permits disclosures uh, where you have the victim of a crime or where there's a crime on the premises of the healthcare provider, where there is a death that's caused by criminal activity or where you have uh, release of limited identifying information to help identify a suspect or a fugitive or a missing person. Um, those are permitted, and OCR does not speak to how that might play out. Um, but uh, if you think about that Texas case, for example, where the nurse notified law enforcement, you know, there is the potential for that to happen again, where somebody uh, in the healthcare setting might decide, oh, this is a, um, a crime on the premises that's happened, or, or what have you. Next slide, please, uh, Erica. And so um, <clears throat> there was one other provision within HIPAA that OCR pointed to, and that was permitted disclosures to avert a serious health, uh, a, rather a serious threat to health or safety. And that's a provision within HIPAA that permits disclosure of protected health information where there is a uh, serious and imminent threat to health or safety and where the disclosure is permitted by law and permitted by professional ethics. Now, OCR's position on this was that it would not be consistent with professional ethics to make a disclosure to law enforcement or other 
uh, person regarding an individual's interest, intent, or prior experience with reproductive health care. Um, there, the imminent part is also uh, a key feature of this particular provision. Uh, HIPAA, or rather HHS indicated back in 2000 when the rule was finalized that this is a provision that should be very rarely, very rarely used. Um, and so in any event, that was OCR's take on that particular provision as well. Let's go to the next slide. And so there was one other guidance document that was issued on the same day from OCR, and that related to digital privacy, which is also a big concern following Dobbs, where you know folks use um, apps on their phone or uh, put data into search engines, and that that data might fall into the wrong hands. And so OCR issued this guidance back in June, and it was really advising consumers that they need to take steps to protect themselves, that they should avoid downloading uh, unnecessary applications, that they should deny unnecessary requests for location data from apps, and that they should disable location services on their devices where, uh, where possible. And uh, so we'll see that uh, kind of concern about the digital uh, privacy come up as well on, and some other um, slides that we'll we'll see in just a minute. Next slide. Uh, and so this was a headline actually from uh, just a couple of weeks ago as well from uh, Australia, where there was a uh, ransom attack on a healthcare insurer, and the hackers released abortion data after the uh, insurer did not pay the ransom. So I just wanted to note that as well, that in addition to concerns around legal disclosure of uh, data, there is also, you know, this concern that there might be a data breach in which could expose the data of individuals relating to reproductive health. And so that is a concern as well. Next slide, please. So just wrapping up this federal piece, um, here is a, a guidance document from the network also, which uh, is available to you and which covers the guidance that was issued by HHS and provides some additional uh, analysis. Next slide. And um, next slide, please, uh, Erica. And so um, then, uh, I just want to mention Biden's executive order. This was in July after the guidance had come out from OCR, and Biden asked several executive agencies to uh, um, issue um, some guidance and to enhance privacy of reproductive health records. That resulted in HHS issuing this uh, guidance document here, the Healthcare Under Attack Report, and they pointed to the two um, guidance documents that they had already published. And then they also referenced the information blocking rule, which they said provides protection for patient privacy and choice when it comes to sharing electronic health information. And there they might be pointing to the uh, privacy exceptions within the information blocking rule. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and then just the last thing here on the federal actions, I just wanted to mention there, there were several bills over uh, the last six months designed to protect uh, mostly data around reproductive health. And you see those on screen here. Um, and generally speaking, like the, the My Body, My Data Act, that would create various privacy protections for personal reproductive or sexual health information. Um, and then you see these other acts on here as well, um, including the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. That's the more broad, comprehensive data privacy bill, which has not been passed, but that would be something that would be all encompassing and would be um, similar to GDPR that they have in the European Union or one of the uh, state comprehensive privacy laws that we have uh, so far in the United States, including California and Colorado and, and a handful of other states. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the state action around privacy of reproductive health records. And there's a few things I'm going to mention here, uh, including a uh, West Coast multi-state commitment and uh, some executive orders from governors in uh, states that are um, supportive of reproductive health rights. 
and then um, some other legislative uh, updates. So let's start with the uh, uh, multi-state commitment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And so uh, the day that the Dobbs decision was issued, California, Oregon, and Washington issued a multi-state commitment. It's about a two-page document in which they made um, uh, promises to uh, protect against uh, the misuse of medical records and other personal and sensitive health information, and they would protect against cooperation with out-of-state investigations. And that's something that comes up in a lot of the state activity that we have seen is measures that would prohibit state agencies and employees from cooperating with out-of-state investigations, uh, investigations in states in which abortion is not legal, uh, trying to gather information in a state uh, like California or Oregon or Washington that are supportive of reproductive health rights. And um, I just noted on the screen here is some executive orders that were issued by uh, governors in California and Colorado and Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. And uh, while they, they vary uh, in their content, they generally also point to this no cooperation or provision of information in support of out-of-state um, proceedings, so civil or criminal or administrative proceedings that stem from reproductive health services. Um, some of them point to no extradition as well to other states. And then the Michigan uh, executive order is interesting in that it expressly points to the privacy of reproductive health records and states that uh, Michigan state agencies must safeguard the privacy of individuals seeking health care, including the privacy of their health data. And so that is a positive development. Next slide, please. And so then that brings us to a few uh, legislative actions uh, on the state level, including this one from California, uh, which is AB 2091, which has been approved by the uh, legislature and by the governor. And that uh, states that a uh, provider shall not release medical information that would identify an individual or that is related to an individual seeking or obtaining an abortion to law enforcement for either enforcement of another state's law that would interfere with a person's right to an abortion under California law or enforcement of a foreign civil action. Next slide, please. Um, here is a similar law that was passed in Connecticut, uh, which states that healthcare providers may not disclose any communication or information received from a patient or obtained during the physical exam of a patient relating to reproductive healthcare services permitted under Connecticut's laws in any proceeding without a patient's written consent. And it does contain uh, some exceptions. And that is actually also a common theme amongst these laws as well, that um, you know, as long as the activity is legal in these states like California and Connecticut, then they will not cooperate with out-of-state investigations. Next slide, please. And then there was a package of laws that were passed in New York uh, around the same topic, including this one, uh, which states that no court or county clerk shall issue a subpoena under this section in connection with an out-of-state proceeding. So no... Uh, investigator out of state could seek the assistance of a court in New York to obtain a subpoena as part of an investigation uh, that is related to abortion. Next slide, please. And then uh, this is another New York one uh, stating that no state or local law enforcement agency shall cooperate with or provide information to any individual or out of state agency uh, regarding the provision of a lawful abortion performed in this state. So again, it's lawful in New York, um, therefore they will not cooperate. It also states that no information relating to any medical procedure performed on a specific individual may be shared with an out-of-state agency or any individual. Next slide, please. And then this last one uh, from New York. Uh, so uh, court in New York shall not issue an order in aid of a deposition as part of an action that's pending in another jurisdiction in connection with an out-of-state proceeding relating to an abortion, uh, which are legally performed in New York. 
And uh, next slide, please. And so uh, then in Pennsylvania, uh, there was the Protecting Pregnant Person Privacy uh, Law, which uh, limits services, pregnancy centers, uh, uh, says that they may not disclose non-public personal health information about an individual unless an authorization is obtained from the individual. And it does include some pretty significant exceptions uh, where uh, disclosures are uh, required by law. Um, and so that's another one. And then let's go to the next slide. Uh, there's just uh, one more I want to mention here from New Jersey, uh, which states similarly that a New Jersey public entity or employee shall not provide any information or expend resources in furtherance of any interstate investigation or proceeding seeking to impose civil or criminal liability upon a person for the provision of reproductive health care services or assisting or advising somebody um, in relation to reproductive health care services. Next slide, please. And then uh, just the last piece here on the state action, uh, just this last, uh, I guess two weeks ago now, attorneys general in several states that you see on the screen here, California, Connecticut, uh, DC, Illinois, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington, issued a letter to Apple about the uh, Apple App Store uh, seeking and encouraging Apple to audit uh, the apps that are on the App Store for compliance with Apple's privacy standards and um, calling on Apple to conduct those audits saying that uh, the data that is collected by apps on Apple's App Store can be weaponized against consumers by law enforcement and private entities and individuals. Um, and so they're asking that those apps meet those privacy standards from the uh, from Apple. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so that's the federal stuff and the local stuff, or rather the state stuff out of the way. And then I just wanted to mention a few updates um, on the local level. And you see there is uh, a list of localities here, which um, I won't read out, but that pass very similar resolutions that relate to uh, reproductive health and the privacy of reproductive uh, health information. Um, and those resolutions generally prohibit uh, the city or county or locality from uh, funds from being used to store or catalog reports on abortion um, or to provide information to any other government body or agency about an abortion um, unless the provision of the information relates to the defense of the rights of the patient or the healthcare provider. And then similarly, it bars funds and resources from being used to conduct surveillance or collect information to determine whether an abortion has occurred. Next slide, please. Um, and incidentally, you know, here uh, with the local action, we've captured uh, a few of the developments on the local level, but obviously with 3,000 plus counties across the United States, it's not possible to uh, include them all here. But here's two more uh, from Philadelphia and from Chicago. Um, the headline here is uh, from Chicago stating that city council passes a bodily autonomy ordinance in an effort to protect those seeking reproductive health care. So the mayor in Chicago had, had issued an executive order around non-cooperation with investigations by another jurisdiction, Chicago being in Illinois, which is supportive of uh, reproductive health rights. Um, and then the city council passed an ordinance uh, in September, which uh, was similar to the executive order and put the same language into uh, the municipal code within Chicago. And then in Philadelphia, similarly, uh, there was the reproductive freedom package, which was three bills. Uh, which so far has approved in committee, um, but have not been uh, approved um, yet. And that the three bills in, in question there would bar healthcare providers from sharing reproductive health care information if they know or should know that the information will be used for litigation. And uh, so next slide, please. So um, that is the update on steps on the federal, state, and local level around protecting uh, the privacy of reproductive health records. 
Um, you can see just based on the information that we provided here that there is real concern and there is a real risk to the privacy of reproductive health records uh, following the Dobbs decision. Um, there are the guidance documents that I mentioned from HHS around HIPAA, particularly as it relates to law enforcement, and then also the guidance around uh, data within apps. Uh, I just want to point out, as we kind of hinted at, that you know HIPAA is not ironclad. It is a law that includes many different provisions which allow for the kinds of disclosures that generally have to happen uh, in our society around things like provision of, of health care, but other things like public health and um, eliminating fraud and waste and also disclosures to law enforcement. And so that is uh, a uh, continuing concern around the ability of law enforcement to access um, uh, reproductive health records. And then, as I mentioned, several states have taken action towards uh, barring uh, handing over reproductive health information to out-of-state prosecutors and to law enforcement. And this is a, a picture that continues to uh, develop as recently as last weekend. There was the update from Indiana around the access of the attorney general there to uh, the reproductive health records of the 10-year-old that was involved in that case. And so with that, I am going to pass things over to my colleague, Carrie Wagner. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I will bring us home today and talk more um, about the data sharing landscape kind of generally post-op. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about HIPAA generally post op a little bit about abortion um, reporting laws, and then the general data sharing um, analysis. And I want to acknowledge Rachel asked a question in the chat about implications for DOBs um, and for post DOBs for public health collecting data. Um, so I'm talking more generally, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, is how to approach that analysis um, for a data sharing request or for public health when you're, you're collecting data. Um, and one thing I'll also mention um, in regards to development at the legislative level is just that in response to, to Rachel's question that public health should be, you know, they, to the extent that they can, monitoring um, privacy legislation that may come up in general or in this space so that um, public health ability to collect data and have the data it needs while also protecting privacy um, of not only reproductive records but records generally can can be met so and we have a, a resource um, on that that's more in the general sense not the reproductive health sense that I can put in the chat later on next slide please so a question we've gotten um, quite a bit after the Dobbs decision is whether HIPAA provides protection for abortion-related medical records. Um, and the answer is that it does, but generally only as HIPAA already protected that sort of information. And just so, to give some, kind of go back to basics for a minute on HIPAA, um, not knowing how familiar our audience is with it today. Um, so HIPAA applies to covered entities which are typically healthcare providers, healthcare clearinghouses, and health plans, um, and their business associates, which are generally contractors that are doing work um, on the covered entity's behalf. And so HIPAA requires covered entities to protect the privacy and security of protected health information, or PHI. And PHI is individually identifiable health information um, that relates to the past, present, or future health condition treatment or payment of health care for um, an individual. So generally HIPAA's privacy um, rule requires a written authorization from the individual in order for covered entities to um, disclose the protected health information. Um, but contrary to popular belief, sometimes HIPAA is a pro-disclosure statute. And as Stephen talked about, there are a number of exceptions to HIPAA's rule around written authorization. Um, to disclose protected health information. And I've listed a couple of those on the slide here. So treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, or TPO, as, as we affectionately call it, really cover treatment for, uh, you know, by healthcare providers for an individual's condition, payment through health plans for that condition. And then healthcare operations are really all the business of those, and those covered entities, whether that be things like care coordination or quality improvement um, and a host of other of other things. 
the as required by law exception that Stephen mentions where another law mandates disclosure of protected health information, HIPAA would allow that without the written authorization. Um, and public health activities is another common exception where a covered entity may um, disclose protected health information to a public health department or a public health authority um, for public health purposes. One thing I want to note before we move on is that HIPAA has kind of an unusual preemption standard. So when we think about preemption, typically it's you know, the federal law will trump state law, will state law will trump local law when you know the laws conflict and are sufficiently related to the same subject. So in practice, the the preemption analysis can get you know pretty complicated. But for our purposes today, when I think HIPAA applies that general rule, HIPAA would preempt a state law on health information privacy unless that state law actually goes further and provides greater privacy protections to an individual's PHI. So in that way, HIPAA sets the floor. States must at least, or covered entities must at least follow um, HIPAA. But if a state provides greater protection, they have to follow the state law. And, and many states have provided for certain subsets of health information like HIV, um, substance use, behavioral health, for example, and in some cases now on um, reproductive records, uh, where states have provided greater protections and you'd have to look to state law in complying with that in terms of the privacy of the information. Next slide. So shifting gears quickly to um, abortion reporting laws. Uh, so CDC has partnered with states for probably the last four decades or so um, to collect aggregate statistics on abortion. And while that reporting to CDC is not required, most states report at least some data to um, CDC. And as you can see by the slide, the majority of states in the District of Columbia require providers um, to make re reports related to abortion um, to the state government. And those Reporting requirements vary in terms of the, the level um, and breadth of information that's required to be reported. Some states, for example, require the method of payment, post-abortion complications. Um, interestingly, the, the reason for seeking an abortion or whether the fetus was viable at the time of abortion. And so, so the figure here, the 46 states that, that have these requirements is as of early November um, and are provided by the Guttmacher Institute. So the source there at the bottom of the page um, goes to a chart on their website that shows you all the different jurisdictions that have abortion reporting requirements and then the type of information that is required to be, be reported. So from a HIPAA standpoint, HIPAA would generally allow this disclosure, and would allow a covered entity, that healthcare provider or a hospital to report to the state um, the required abortion-related information. And I can think of a couple exceptions that would be likely to apply. Again, the required by law exception if the abortion reporting was mandated by state law. Additionally, if the reporting was to the state public health department and it was for a public health purpose, the public health ex exception might apply um, as well. And this would function, you know, kind of like any other data sharing request that's required by law or fell under through the public health exception. Um, with the, the recent developments in state and local legislation um, that Stephen mentioned and just the kind of shifting privacy landscape in this area, it's also important I think, to be looking at the state law landscape. And um, certainly if there is a state law that protects reproductive health records further to go through that preemption analysis um, under HIPAA to determine whether the state law or HIPAA would apply. Next slide. So then there, what's the general data sharing analysis um, post Dobbs? So first you've got to, you know, gather the factual information, the kind of who, what, where, when, why, I, I typically say. Um, and I want to say today first, before I jump into the, the factual pieces um, of a data sharing request, uh, just that I'm focusing today really from a legal perspective. I want to acknowledge that you know, good data governance requires procedures and, and processes for data holders regarding um, how the data they have is used and um, managed and protected. And so I don't have time to kind of go into that whole framework in detail, but just wanted to acknowledge there's more to it, um, even though I'm focusing on the, the legal pieces today. So for the factual information, um, you know, what is the purpose of the data sharing? Um, what does the recipient want to do with the data? Who's 
sharing the data, who's receiving the data, um, why? Why is the data needed or requested? What's the purpose or the goal of the data and, and the suggested analysis? How much data is needed? Is it identifiable? Is it de-identified, for example? Um, and then once you have all that factual information, what laws apply? Does HIPAA apply? Do you have state privacy laws, abortion reporting laws, other privacy laws at the state or federal level? And then analyze the facts. Um, and I say with your legal counsel, and while that's always, um, it's always good to involve your legal counsel, certainly, um, just given the shifting landscape here and the legislative activity, what was true a few months ago may not be true today. And what's um, true two months from now or so may not be what was true today. And so looking, you know, and confirming the legal landscape as part of the data sharing analysis, particularly around reproductive records, I think is, is going to be really important. So assuming that the data can be shared, then what protections are in place? Do you need a data use agreement? Um, any special terms and conditions that need to be put in place um, to better protect or especially protect reproductive or abortion related um, data? Are secondary uses allowed, for example? What privacy and security measures would be in place? Um, and, and those things are, are always things to, to consider, but certainly are there any um, ethical or equity considerations in the, in the data sharing, you know, even if it's allowed legally. Next slide. And so I'll just round out, I wanted to give us, now that I kind of walked through that general framework, just put that to um, a hypothetical today. And so our facts for this hypothetical are, we have a researcher with a state university who wants to access abortion-related data that's held by the State Department of Health and Human Services and wants to access that data for the purpose of assessing abortion outcomes across communities and, and assessing any um, inequities. So the state DHHS is a HIPAA hybrid entity and HIPAA applies to the data being requested. And so while it, the data requested does not contain direct identifiers, we know that it is protected health information. So again, now that we've got that sort of factual basis of sort of who, what, where, why, uh, let's look at what law applies. So because of the way I set this up, I've already identified that, that HIPAA applies because the state DHHS is a HIPAA hybrid entity and that HIPAA applies to the data requested and the data requested is protected health information. So then we look, are there any exceptions to the general rule that requires the individual's written authorization? And the most likely to be applicable here is HIPAA's research exception, since this is um, data requested by a researcher at a university for a research purpose. And so you'd have to analyze that exception. There's kind of a number of pieces to it and see whether or not that could be met. And then look to state law. Again, are there any abortion-related healthcare or general privacy laws? And, and with a particular eye towards are there any preemption issues with HIPAA, does state law go further in protecting this data um, for the purpose that it's being requested? And then finally, are there any other state or federal um, laws? And, and in my example here, because we have research and it involves um, people, there's a possibility this could be human subjects research and that the common rule um, could apply and need to be analyzed in terms of this data sharing request. And so in addition, I, I would suggest that organizations also look at beyond kind of just the strict, strictly legal piece I just outlined, um, what are their policies and procedures? Typically, unless the data is mandated to be disclosed by law, um, it's permissive. Typically, you may disclose the data, but you don't necessarily have to disclose the data. And so that's where some of those policy considerations, both what are your written policies and procedures around data privacy and protecting data. But again, are there any ethical considerations? Might people be harmed by this, um, particularly in the context um, of where we find ourselves with abortion related data um, today? And are there any equity considerations, for example? So those would be other pieces um, to look at. And next slide. Well, I'll just wrap this up and then we can turn it over to Q&A. Um, HIPAA applies much as it did before the Dobbs decision. Uh, most states require some reporting on abortions and HIPAA would, would very likely you know, allow this disclosure. And again, the, the data sharing analysis is, 
analyze the facts, determine the applicable laws, um, and assess data sharing, and just noting again that this landscape is changing and is likely to continue changing around abortion-related and reproductive health. And so outside of the law enforcement context and the guidance and the laws that, that Stephen went over today, again, the legal landscape on data sharing, um, particularly at the federal level and talking about HIPAA in particular, is largely the same. And I'll drive it home with just because you um, can share data does not necessarily mean you have to share data. Uh, and at the bottom of the slide, there is a checklist, a resource that um, is available on our website that helps you gather the information um, particularly the factual information that you might need to address a data sharing request. And so with that, I'll go to the next slide. Just note that this is um, where you can connect or how you can connect with Erica, Stephen, and myself. And with that, we can open it up for questions. Great. Thank you, Erica, Stephen, and Carrie. Those were all great presentations. We do have a couple questions. I'm going to turn it first back to Carrie. We had a very specific question about the example you gave and whether or not that is actually a PHI because the data doesn't contain identifiable information in your hypothetical. Sure, that's a good question. Um, so when I gave kind of the definition of protected health information broadly as individually identifiable information, and um, so one of the ways when we look at if, like, when you look at HIPAA, like, is it protected health information? Um, you know, could it reasonably identify the individual? And so in my hypothetical, I made an assumption that while it wasn't say if I was the patient using my name and date of birth, there might've been other information in there that could have identified me. Um, and then if you want to take it sort of outside of HIPAA's purview, you have to look at um, typically, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the expert method of de-identification and the safe harbor method of de-identification. And the safe harbor um, requires that you remove 18 different identifiers. And those are, you know, I mean, things like address, five-digit zip code, um, and, you know, and so on. And there's also kind of a catch-all of anything you know that might be able to be tied to the individual. So that can end up being a really nuanced analysis. And so that is a, a good observation about the hypothetical and one that I might present a little differently just to be clearer about that. Um, but it's, it's not as clear as saying like, oh, you have just my name and date of birth. There are lots of other ways that information could be connected back to an individual. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Erica now. We actually got a question on just asking for more information on how Section 1115 waivers might work. So could you talk a little bit more about those? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I know I briefly defined 1115 waivers, um, but they um, Section 1115 of the Social Security Act gives um, the Secretary of HHS approval authority to approve experimental pilot or demonstration projects. Um, that are found to be likely to assist in promoting objectives of Medicaid. Um, so the purpose is to give states additional flexibility to design and improve their individual programs. Um, so it's a really interesting tool, and we see that used a lot during emergencies. Um, and so back in August, the, um, the Secretary of HHS sent a letter to um, some U.S. governors inviting them to work with CS CMS and apply for 1115 waivers um, to provide increased care um, in states where reproductive rights were under attack. So it was a really, he was just inviting states to, you have this authority available to you where you can take our federal funds, you can work with CMS and provide additional pathways to care um, to women in your state to receive abortion care. Um, and so that's out there. And so far, none of the states have bitten yet. Um, I would really like to see some states look into that. I think it's a really great re a way to uh, expand um, care in the state. Um, but it's be up to the state to come up with a plan and then send this back and work that we request that um, approval from CMS. Um, so we haven't seen a state do that yet, but we're going to continue watching for that. But great question. Great. Thank you, Erica. So we had a comment earlier about how reproductive health data is available in so many different places. So maybe Stephen or Carrie, could you clarify? Does HIPAA apply to all health records regarding reproductive health data? One of the examples was, especially with telehealth rising, like Erica talked about, you know, even just like Zoom logs of, or 
webinar transcripts and stuff from these virtual interactions? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm happy to jump in and, and help answer it. Uh, so I think Carrie mentioned that, uh, you know, just kind of on the ground level, HIPAA applies to protected health information of covered entities, and that's either directly or indirectly. So you could have a business associate that's involved in handling protected health information on behalf of a covered entity. So you may have situations in which uh, uh, you have a covered entity, and I should say also that covered entities include covered healthcare providers. Not every healthcare provider is a covered entity, but the vast majority are. It's basically a healthcare provider that engages in billing. Uh, that's a very summarized explanation. But um, so I guess the short answer is no. HIPAA does not apply to every type of health data, but it does apply to protected health information of a covered entity. And there are other laws, though, state laws typically, that uh, also come into play. And so uh, they may apply to different data sets. If you have, for example, a crisis pregnancy center that does not engage in electronic billing, and maybe it's not a covered entity for that reason, um, they likely are still subject to state privacy laws. You may have a state medical record law or a state law that deals with um, medical information, or there's different variants of it. And then, you know, with respect to app data, then I think we will see as state consumer protection around privacy continues to evolve in the United States that um, those laws like the um, uh, California uh, uh, Consumer Protection Law, that uh, will kick in. Um, and then there's just a handful of other states that have these consumer protection laws um, that would apply to, uh, potentially apply to things like app data um, and, and search engine data. So that was a long-winded answer to your question, but I hope I covered it. And I wanted to add one more thing on HIPAA. Um, a common misconception about HIPAA is that it follows the data. So once a covered entity like discloses it, that HIPAA follows all along you know, the way. Um, and that's not the case actually. So um, it, the analysis starts with, you know, do you have a covered entity that's subject to HIPAA? So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, it isn't, you know, HIPAA does not follow the data, um, so it really is dependent on, on who holds the data and whether that entity itself is subject to HIPAA. Great, thank you both. So another question we got was about kind of this instance that Eric mentioned where maybe a patient presents to an ER for bleeding but doesn't actually disclose that they had an abortion, but then a doctor finds out after the fact that it was an abortion. Um, is there any, are there any disclosure requirements there or health sharing requirements there? Maybe Carrie or Stephen, you want to answer that one? Sure. I think, um, it would depend on what the state reporting law says and how they define, you know, if it was just reporting after, um, an abortion procedure or whether it was um, required to report in a circumstance like the um, question was asked. And I think that's really gonna depend on a case-by-case -case analysis of state law. So not something um, like I could address with more specificity right here. Great, and the follow-up kind of to that question is whether or not miscarriage-related data is also being reported to state and public health authorities, similar to the abortion related data. I don't know, Carrie or Stephen, you want to touch on that? But not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, not that I'm aware of. I have to do some more research on that. But from what I've done, it's, it's really around um, abortion because miscarriage could be caused by any number of things not related to abortion. Uh, Madison, you're muted actually right now. Thank you. <laughs> Another question we had um, was about HIPAA's kind of minimum necessary standards and whether or not those could actually be used as a tool to limit disclosures where required by law. Um, so this question is asking about thinking about de-identifying data even under existing reporting laws. 
So I think the short answer on that is no, that uh, minimum necessary typically does not apply to disclosures that are required by law. Where you have a disclosure that is required by law, you have to comply with that law, whether that is you know, a specific law that says that you have to disclose or whether it is a court order. You don't really get to decide how you're going to respond with data, You know whether you're going to use de-identified data or identifiable data. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have a subpoena, you could move to quash the subpoena, but um, generally required by law does not trigger minimum necessary concerns. And I would just add that even, and I, I agree with what Stephen said, even though you might not be looking at the minimum necessary standard, is to look carefully at like what is required by law. Um, you know, in, in my experience, sometimes we're not both on the same page about what it means to fulfill that requirement. Great, thank you. So I'm going to turn this next question to Erica. Um, we had a question about maybe nurses or healthcare providers who are trying to help their clients access abortion, either in other states or through medic medication abortion. Um, and the question is kind of if there need to be employee policies protecting these kinds of actions and taking a health equity lens to that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Erica. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it, I mean, certainly it'd be helpful to have internal policies um, that would um, depict how that would work. Um, but a lot of that is just going to depend on what the different laws in the books are in the different states. And I think depending on where, what state we're talking about, that could look very different. Um, Carrie or Stephen, do you have any thoughts on this one? I guess the one thing that would occur to me would be, you know, for nurses to also consider their license and just make sure that you're acting within your license and not getting into trouble with state licensing boards. That that um, unfortunate case in Indiana that I mentioned, you know, there's there's quite a spat going on between the attorney general and the physician that's involved in that particular case, and he reported the physician to the state licensing board. Um, so I guess that's just kind of like a, uh, a word of warning, I guess. Great, thank you both. So another question we got was, as more states are seeking to restrict access to abortions, um, how many of the currently 46 states collecting abortion-related data will continue to do so as abortion is restricted? I mean, I think that remains to be seen. Um, kind of that list that I was referencing, um, I think it's actually, I think I said it was as of early November, as I'm looking at it now, it says as of December 1st. Um, so, so far, it appears that all the states are still requiring that information, but it'll be interesting to see whether any um, of them, you know, seek to restrict that reporting um, as abortion might be more restricted, but I would imagine in states that are um, restricting abortion, they may want to know um, and, and still have that reporting. And kind of a follow-up to that, and maybe Stephen, you can touch on this as well. Do you know of any state lawmakers who are seeking to access this abortion-related surveillance data um, from the state or local public health authorities? Lawmakers I'm not aware of. Um, I think, you know, the big concern that has been raised around reproductive health data is law enforcement gaining access to it, um, which, you know, is the, the um, pointer that we mentioned earlier uh, during the presentation. So um, I am not aware of lawmakers seeking to gain access to such data or what authority they would use to gain access to such data if they did want to obtain, certainly if they wanted to obtain identifiable data. I'm not clear on what authority they would use to do that. Great, thank you. So this next question, I'll turn it first to Erica and then maybe Stephen or Carrie will want to jump in on how these First Amendment um, challenges might impact abortion related data practices. So Erica, I don't know if you want to start with that one. Yeah, great. Thank you. 
Um, so turning the Supreme Court first, zooming out from just Dobbs, this court has been very active in First Amendment law. Um, the same term as the Dobbs decision, they decided a case where I'm sure you remember with the football coach and um, praying on the side of games where the court had this very expansive view of balancing First Amendment freedoms um, against other freedoms like freedom of religion or First Amendment like uh, Establishment Clause um, freedoms. And this court has also on Monday heard a case um, against a um, Colorado website designer who wanted to preemptively um, not or say she wasn't going to provide websites for um, same-sex marriages. Um, so the court could really expand First Amendment there too. Um, so this court is very active on the First Amendment round. Um, so turning back to abortion, um, a lot of states want to limit how people talk about abortion if they're sharing information of how to gain one. I think Stephen mentioned a case too where um, a girl had was in Facebook messages and she was talking about how could she get an abortion, what options are out there, and um, that was obtained and was being used um, against her. Um, so policing what, so like states are trying to pass laws and pass legislation that they're restricting people's ability to speak freely on um, abortion access options. And that's very troubling with this Supreme Court. Um, and there are real examples of how this is playing out. But yeah, Stephen and Maddie, I can, or Stephen and, um, sorry, I'm sure you have something to say about this too. I don't know that I have anything to add actually, Erica. I think I will defer to your excellent answer that you provided. Same. Okay, so we just got a couple more questions in. Um, I think I'm going to go back to you, Erica. We got another question on the 1115 waivers. Um, and the question is just presumably states that would still need to apply for those 1115 waivers are states that are hostile to abortion. So kind of just asking what the thought is around states applying for those waivers when they may be abortion hostile. Yeah, great question. Um, the beauty of the 1115 waivers is that states can be innovative and creative. So when they're developing plans to submit to CMS for approval, there's uh, theoretically um, not many limits on what they could think of. Um, one limit that would, because you're, you're right, you're, we're talking about abortion hostile states and they're trying to help expand access within their Medicaid programs. Um, and as I had on the slide, one way that uh, would work in practice would be using funds to transport patients across state lines. Um, but then again, as we discussed, like the major hurdle there would be you can't, under um, the Hyde Amendment, we can't use federal funds to directly pay for the procedure. So there is a lot of difficulty with like designing a program that keeps funds separate and just doles out money to um, to be in compliance with the Hyde Amendment, but still using funds for travel um, and other expenses that may come up. Uh, but again, if, I'd love to see a abortion hostile state design um, program, but you're right, you're, when you're dealing with political constraints, I'm not sure if they would have an incentive to design a program, but maybe a, um, a state that is more expansive, like uh, we mentioned the block on the West Coast, um, Oregon, Washington, California, they could potentially design a program where they help people in their state, they can use some of their own funds to help people, um, would be a great way to do that. But yeah, great follow-up question on that program. Great, thank you. So we have another question. I think I'm gonna turn this to Steven as you've been mentioning how law enforcement is involved with public health data um, and reproductive data. So this is a question about if the Supreme Court completely bans abortions under concepts of fetal personhood, um, and then we see abortion surveillance practices continuing, then how law enforcement may be able to access that data from public health authorities. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I guess this goes back to just this like concern that law enforcement um, may seek to access uh, abortion uh, related data. And as we mentioned, there are several paths within the HIPAA privacy rule in, in which um, law enforcement can seek to gain access to uh, protected health information. Obviously, HIPAA is just one law. We're talking a lot about it here because it does come up a lot. Um, there are state laws that are involved too, but um, within HIPAA's privacy rule, there are the permitted uses and disclosure to law enforcement and OCR, their take on it was that these uh, permitted disclosures are very narrow and uh, they use the term narrowly tailored, um, but they are, you know, they're broad in, in many ways. And uh, so there are a several different opportunities for law enforcement, several different routes for 
law enforcement to seek to gain access to reproductive health data. Um, and that, that hasn't changed. And, and I would just add in terms of, um, I think the question might have also been getting to like the interplay then with um, abortion surveillance, so abortion reporting laws. Um, and I think you'd have to look at how, what's required to be reported and then also um, what confidentiality protections are there, whether a state has gone further and passed you know, legislation to particularly protect abortion and reproductive health data. Um, or whether through the reporting requirements, because often with public health reporting, you they collect a lot of information, but there's often um, privacy protections like the communicable disease and HIV and so on. Um, so how is that, but it, um, if at all, how is that data? And it typically in the abortion context, um, or at least in my experience from what I've looked at, um, it is protected in some way. So there may be um, some protections in place there, whether it would go far enough to protect that information, like the, the reproductive or the abortion related data that's reported under state law, um, whether those protections go far enough, I think you'd have to look at on a case by case basis. Great, thank you. So we have just a couple minutes left. I do wanna add that there is a chat survey that was just shared in the chat um, regarding your feedback. So we would really appreciate if you take a moment to check out this link and give us your feedback on the webinar. Um, I think we can just wrap up with this one follow-up question on whether or not there are actually any ongoing efforts to limit law enforcement access to public health data as we've been talking about it. Um, I can venture an answer, uh, which is that uh, I cannot think of a uh, systematic effort right now to limit law enforcement's access to uh, reproductive health data. Um, you know, I think in terms of policy, you know, we think about other types of data like HIV or STI or um, uh, other uh, mental health, like other data that has uh, elevated privacy protections. You know, perhaps there's a policy discussion in the future as to whether uh, abortion related data should have similar heightened levels of uh, protection, but that does not exist right now. Well, I think we're just about at that time, but thank you to Carrie, Stephen, and Erica for a great presentation and to everyone who joined us and for all the great questions we got.